So I'm very pleased that my friend Ali Isom is here today, and you've read her bio, so I won't go through it, and she'll go through some of it anyway in her presentation, I suspect. Um, but uh, it's probably worth mentioning that Ali and I were students at BYU together many years ago, and I remember her because she was in the same public opinion and voting behavior class with me, and the reason she's memorable is that she, uh, at least a few times, brought a kid to class oh, with you once, 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 at least more than once. In any case, uh, that's less of a thing at BYU these days, but back in the 90s, it was, I think, more of a thing than maybe it is now. Yeah. yeah she was, although Allie had to get up and leave a time or two, but it's okay. What I, what, the reason I remember that and the reason I'm pointing it out is that uh, it's not everyone in the world that, uh, that goes to class with their kid. And what that told me about Allie is that she was gonna come to class, whether <laughs> she had a babysitter or didn't, or the, you know, uh, short of, of being sick or the kid being sick and, and not being able to take out uh, of the house, she was gonna be there. And it, it gives you a sense of her sort of commitment to her own education and her career path. And you'll get a very good flavor for the fact that she's a go-getter and has a lot of energy and a lot of vision. The other reason why I invite her to speak, and I've had her several times now, and I'm going to keep imposing on her as long as she'll continue to say yes, is that I don't know of a better example for you. And when I say you, I mean both men and women of a woman in the church that has a career that is as grounded and focused and as sensible about that kind of thing as she is. Uh, so if, if you, uh, as many of you are, and again, both men and women, you, you sort of think about, well, you know, should a woman have a career? Should I have a family? How do I balance those things? And if you're a man, you know, you're thinking, well, I'll, you know, how, when I get married, when we get married, what sh who should do what and how, how should all this work? Allie has important things to say about that that are worth listening to and modeling uh, as at least one way to successfully do that. And I think it's important to, to put those examples, a variety of those examples in front of you because, um, uh, how do I say this? In our particular little subculture, uh, we don't often model that very well, and we need more uh, ways to think about it and talk about it, and she does it in a very good way. So if, if I haven't primed, if she doesn't talk about it directly, I hope I've primed you to ask questions about that so that at least we have a conversation about that. And, and with that, I'll turn the time over to Ali Isom. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. It's really my honor to be with you. I love coming back here. My husband and I are reluctant BYU cliches. Um, I, I, uh, BYU was not my first choice uh, for school, but this is where God sent me, and uh, that launched a number of decisions that I made that um, weren't according to plan, but have ended up better than I ever imagined. So uh, I am here, I recognize that m most of your guests are going to be speaking from certain arenas, and I used to be in a purely uh, political arena, and some who also work for the church might say I still am um, in a political arena, but um, I don't have a single isolated industry that we're gonna talk about. My career is really um, public policy, public affairs, strategic communication, organizational and management strategy, and coalition building and stakeholder engagement. So it's uh, kind of a, a niche sometimes to be in that skill set. Uh, and, and my career path, I firmly believe, has been guided by our Heavenly Father. And um, I'll walk you through some of that, and then hopefully we have some time for questions. But um, I began by running local and statewide campaigns and lobbying, um, working in state agencies, which led me then to the governor's office, LDS Public Affairs, um, communication services, and now what is called the Church Communication Department. And uh, I want to... Let me just start with, oh, I forgot I had that slide. Okay. So political campaigns, lobbying, this is, I should have clicked through this, but this is where I began. Um, 
to really start to see God's hand in my life. I, up to that point, I had thought that uh, my life had been a hodgepodge, but I could see as I worked for the governor, Governor Gary Herbert here, the governor of the state of Utah, um, I started to see how God had prepared me in so many ways. It was the convergence of policy, politics, and communications, and some might call it my dream job. I was the deputy chief of staff, communications director, and spokesperson for Governor Herbert for three years. And I left his office in 2013. Every day was different. There were incredibly long days. If he weren't a man of faith, I probably would have worked 16-hour days on Sunday, too. So I was grateful that he was vigilant in his Sunday worship. Um, when I took the job, I was working at the Department of Workforce Services as their government affairs director, and I'd negotiated a sweet deal where I was part-time most of the year and full-time during the legislative session. I worked about 25 to 30 hours a week. I could be home when my kids got home from school. It was great life balance, and I knew taking the job with the governor would be incredibly disruptive to that life balance. I have four children, two girls and two boys at the time that I took the job with the governor. Uh, my oldest was about 16, and my youngest was six. So it was um, a family decision. We had two family councils where we talked about what this would mean if mom were to go do this, that this would be a family commitment, that I wouldn't do this if anyone in the family felt they couldn't support me in this because everyone was going to have to adjust. And um, my husband did the most adjusting of all. Eric took over the laundry, the groceries, and the carpool. And uh, he loved the carpool. I am still, um, I, have, I, I have, with much gratitude in my heart, indulged the man in continuing to maintain his laundry duties. It's fantastic when somebody who's a little OCD does the laundry. Um, but I have not yet convinced him to make a menu before he goes grocery shopping. So we're kind of doubled up on that sometimes. <laughs> because uh, he likes donuts and I don't. Um, my kids all stepped up as well. In the governor's office, I was the primary media interface. I was a policy lead on senior staff. I had a small cadre of legislators where I was their portal into the office. Uh, I had a tremendous experience doing strategic planning on specific issues like gun legislation, sex ed bills, um, the Snake Valley Water Agreement, which is a shared water between us and Nevada. They wanted to stick a giant straw in our aquifer. Uh, judicial nominations. I had a key role in making sure the governor's nominations were approved. And at one point when we had a female nominee and it looked like she was in trouble, we unleashed social media at the time when legislators were largely unprepared for that. And she was confirmed. It was um, a fantastic process. I was also um, assigned to issues like budget, wildfires, windstorms, and the National Governors Association when they came to town. My biggest takeaway from my time in the governor's office is the power of guiding principles. And this is something the Spirit revealed to me, and I'm a firm believer that the Spirit is your greatest mentor. I learned through experience and through teachings through the Spirit that I needed to think of things in this order. People first. Always put a face on whatever you're grappling with. Know whom it affects, the impact it has on their lives, the real stories behind the issue. Then the next is principle. What are the driving principles? If you set your principles first, then whatever comes, you're ready to handle it in an objective way. If you wait to set your principles till the situation's before you, it's too late. You've lost your objectivity. Then policy. I love good policy. Good policy is fair. It thinks through long-term implications and hidden agendas. It creates equitable um, playing fields and it creates good outcomes. Process, process matters. You don't get to good outcomes without good process. And then politics. And if I thought of things in this order, then we got it right. It's when politics started to rise in, into this order or creep in, objectivity is distorted. Uh, it's no longer objectivity, right? Your vision is distorted and your um, Sometimes the principle on which you are trying to pass good legislation or make a good policy decision gets compromised. So um, I'm a big believer in this order, and this has actually stayed with me in other jobs as well. Uh, let me tell you a story about how I left the governor's office. Um, my oldest daughter, that little baby I snuck into class, uh, was a BYU student, art history major, minor in business and had significant health issues. 
type 1 diabetes, Addison's disease, and hypothyroidism. And her life was a balancing act of medications and, um, well, and hormones, frankly. And uh, her senior year at BYU, um, she was found in her, we found her in her apartment, passed away. She had had a severe uh, hypoglycemic episode. Nobody found her in time. And um, that was a transformative experience to have my oldest child die when I'm in the throes of working for the governor. I found myself throughout that year um, in policy meetings, sitting around a table thinking, why are we so worked up over things that don't really matter? And uh, it gave me a chance to step back. And uh, slowly, I was being prompted that it was time to leave the governor's office. I was prompted over a series of two months. The lieutenant governor, Greg Bell at that time, had determined he would be resigning his post. And I felt like I needed to stay and help the governor through that transition for lots of reasons, and then um, tenured my resignation. Now, uh, all governors may not be this way. This governor in particular is, uh, He's, a, he's, he's always the quarterback, he's the point guard, he's, he's used to being in charge, so when somebody's out of formation, it's a little distressing <laughs> to him. And uh, he took it personally when I came in and said, it's time for me to leave. Um, there, was, there were tears and screaming from both of us. <laughs> and I just said, and eventually, Governor, I, I'm sorry, but this comes from a higher power and I'm way more scared of him than I am of you. <laughs> so I, um, I resigned and within, three weeks had other job offers, but let me tell you, I, I, I was commanded by the Spirit, and I don't, I don't get these kind of promptings, but I was told November 22nd will be your last day. November 22nd will be your last day. So I submitted my letter with that date on it, not knowing that the week after that would be the Kitchen v. Herbert decision on gay marriage that it hit the state of Utah. This predated the national decision on gay marriage. This was international news that the headquarters of the LDS Church had just um, had enacted a gay marriage law. And uh, my, my communication staff had no reprieve. They got Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Eve at 4 o'clock and Christmas Day off. But it was nonstop media attention for them. And I was home enjoying my plan B and my fuzzy slippers. Um, because God had told me I needed some time and that he had something for me to do, but it was gonna be revealed to me slowly because my brain needed to slow down and my soul needed some rest and reprieve. So um, this is my daughter, Alyssa, who was the student here. And um, I'm going to say this, that uh, her passing uh, has not only just been a transformational experience, but it has made me realize the high stakes with which we um, grapple with mortality. So I know you all probably have a keen sense of these decisions you're making, but let me tell you with all confidence that your God knows you and will lead you, that nothing is for, uh, ev everything has a reason. There, is, there are no accidents. And even when things don't seem to work out for us, uh, if we turn our hearts to, to God, we will be guided. Um, so this was my post the day I left the governor's office. I felt like I had been on a, a crazy ride. <laughs> and um, then I went to public affairs for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, I, I was initially, well, first of all, they didn't know what to do with me. Elder Perry created the post for me and asked me to come help fix the American family. <laughs> and um, that assignment had a couple of special projects assigned, uh, I was tasked with, and then after a year I was made the Director of Family and Community Relations, and then I took a post in the Communication Services Department as the Director of Institutional Messaging, the first Director of Institutional Messaging, which meant essentially my responsibility was branding and messaging. I'm now the Director of Church Identity and Messaging. It's the same role, it just has a different title in a new department. And uh, I, I love what I do in that every day is still different. And maybe I could uh, walk you through what I'm doing right now. Uh, I'll, I'll do off-site planning with my team and my, form, my fellow directors. Um, I just completed a landmark audience study, global audience study, 
the largest study the church has ever done of both members and those not of our faith. And we learned a lot about how people think about faith, religiosity, and spirituality. We built a universal audience model that our departments will be using and have now a branding strategy so that our leaders can speak in one voice to a global audience as a global church. And hopefully you'll start to see some things there. We are, we are starting to some things, some seeds have been planted, but um, there's a lot of bureaucracy in church headquarters. So you have two strategies. You have the strategy of what you want to accomplish and then you have the strategy to get it approved. So that's where the politics comes in handy. Uh, it, I, I will work um, with BYU on occasion on specific issues. Um, I would do some digital asset management, documentation, product plans, lots of bureaucracy. I was recently also put over all the communication work, both internal and external, for the Temple Square renovation project. So some of you may know that the Salt Lake Temple is being renovated and base isolated, which means it can swing five feet in any direction during an earthquake. It's an incredible engineering feat we're about to undertake. And uh, Temple Square is going to be um, largely different than you know it and they will stabilize the temple as a historic preservation project and then build uh, new visitor experiences for all of you. And some of that strategy that I've been working on will be embedded in those visitor experiences. So we're very excited to see what happens, but this is going to be, um, I'm told now, four plus years of, of um, engaging the public in meaningful ways and helping our members learn more about what God has in store for them in the Holy Temple. Uh, I do lots of uh, problem solving and strategic planning, lots of meetings, lots and lots of meetings. I do consultation with um, other departments, lots of written reports, verbal reports and, and presentations, pre-meetings, post-meetings, and partner and stakeholder engagement. So um, key elements in my being recruited for my current post. Well, let me go back. There's one other key issue that, um, I've had a significant role in, uh, in in public affairs before I came to communications. And that was, I, I was the lead on the redesign of the website of Mormon and Gay. So the church was largely uncomfortable with using the word gay out loud. And um, after much deliberation and putting a face on the, I don't like to call it an issue uh, because it's people but helping leaders see the people that are impacted by these choices. Um, we switched the website title from Mormons and Gays to Mormon and Gay, so that you could be both. They're not mutually exclusive. And to help our leaders and members, um, and, and mostly ecclesiastical leaders, learn how to speak to LGBTQ people. And that's an ongoing issue at headquarters. I have personal feelings about it, and today I don't really wanna talk about those because I'm conflicted in some of the ways we talk about. I can tell you that this last week we had um, what I would call maybe less than ideal framing of our statement on reparative therapy. We are not opposed to uh, the ban on reparative therapy. We're opposed to the bill because the bill is inadequate and the bill before us is not sufficient. But I would say in professional retrospect that the way that was framed was less than ideal and that we needed to reaffirm our position in opposition to reparative therapy. And, um, you know, lesson learned. I think sometimes we learn things the hard way. And this, these decisions are not always made by one person. So I see my stewardship as give them my very best thinking. Then I have my accountability to God. And then the accountability is, the accountability is theirs. I, have this, I learned that from working for the governor. Because one day... <laughs> I was ready to throw my body across a piece of paper on his desk, <laughs> keep him from signing something that I felt uh, impacted way too many people in, in all the wrong ways. And um, I came back to my office pretty upset, shut my door, hit my knees, and said, Heavenly Father, help me. Help me know how to persuade him. Help me know how to help him see. And I was taught through the Spirit that the stewardship is his, that my responsibility is to give him my best thinking. And then the accountability is his. And I'm grateful I had that lesson before I came to headquarters where I now have 20 bosses. Uh, and I apply a lot of those lessons learned. So that gives you kind of a summary. Oh, this is me with a Relief Society in Bengaluru. They're all like five feet tall. I'm not wearing heels. I'm actually wearing flats that day. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
I'm tall. Okay, so practical advice. I tried to think about what would I say to my 22-year-old self? What do I wish I would have known? Uh, what wisdom have I gained? First one is never stop learning. Oh, just be voracious about consuming all you can, all your life. I know many of you are thinking, I can't wait to not have to read the prescribed text for a class and just read something for fun. Okay, that'll last six months, but then once you've recovered, pick up other stuff and start reading stuff that you can continue to learn. Continue to learn and grow because people who are hungry for knowledge are hungry for solutions, are hungry for relationships that matter, are hungry for networks that make a difference. And in political circles, it's all about people and connection. If you want to be hungry and connect with people in all the right ways, learn all you can about the humans who inhabit this earth. Next, keep your skills sharp and your network vibrant. Okay. This is particularly for if you have an interruption in your career path, be it an illness, or I took time out to be with my children. Um, I, I ran political campaigns between pregnancies, and my kids were the best educated campaigners you've ever seen. They always told the carpool how to vote. If they saw certain signs, they could tell people who that candidate was and what they stood for. So, um, you know, I remember canvassing neighborhoods with a kid on my back and a couple in each hand, and. Um, you know, you just, you do what you have to do when you're doing it, but I'm a big believer that there are ways to keep your skill set sharp, even when you take those timeouts. You still, um, in addition to reading, you can be engaged as a volunteer, you can service. There's so many options online that were never available to some of the, the you know, your parents. And you have ways to stay fresh and keep your skills sharp. And don't stop writing, don't stop thinking. Writers rise. Okay, the next thing is leaders are not always at the top of the organizational chart to value influence. This is something that took some time for me to understand because I'm driven, like I, I, I wanna lead. And I have come to understand that it doesn't matter if you're in a senior position on an organizational chart if they're not following you because there are ways to have tremendous lateral influence in an organization and so many organizations can be affected from the ground up, and you can you can uh, put a lot of furrows in before you're in a leadership role. So I, I think this is, I, I, what I, the reason I say this is I think sometimes in political science we think it's only leaders who get to make decisions and be in charge. And that's not true. You can change your environment in many ways, and, and it happens through leadership. The next one is motion is not always momentum. People often mistake motion for momentum. Having a long checklist doesn't mean you're getting anything done. If you want to create real change, there has to be momentum behind it. So learn the difference between those two things. What creates real momentum? Lasting, durable change. Don't mistake a bunch of commotion and activity for making progress on an issue. And sometimes, especially in campaigns, uh, people start to think, well, we've got a bunch of stuff going on. We're making a lot of headway. Not necessarily. So learn how to measure what momentum looks like. The next thing is trust God and put your career on his altar. And he'll make more of you. I've already made this point, but I'm a big believer uh, in this. And I've had the luxury of not having to work. Um, and so it's easy for me to say, right, in some ways, uh, because my husband was fully employed and insured, and uh, we could have survived on his income alone. And that gave me freedom to say the things I really wanted to say and not worry about whether or not I'd be let go because um, integrity matters a lot to me. But I also learned that's what you should be doing anyway, right? Like, that's what you should be doing anyway as a covenant person. Be true to yourself, be true to your God, and he will guide you. And even when you have to say those really hard things that feel super risky, in the end, it's always the best thing for your career, always. And the spirit is your lo most loyal mentor and guide. I, I'm a big believer in mentorship. I mentor a lot of people, male and female. But I have to tell you, the custom mentoring I get through the spirit matters so much more. So if you want to carry a little book around with you, a little notepad in your pocket, or a binder, or whatever it is you, in your journal, keep a list. But pay attention to the promptings you receive and write them down. If you don't write them down, you will never remember them. And you will start to see patterns that God provides you when you start writing them down. When my daughter passed away, I was given guiding principles. I was actually given guiding principles before she died to prepare me for her death. 
And have, um, you know, as a mother, I wanted to follow her around and give her injections and make sure she was stable and she was eating. And, um, you know, that would have undermined her agency entirely. And so God gave me guiding principles when she passed. He gave me guiding principles again when I said, how do I not let this grief and this black void suck me in and destroy me? How do I not succumb to the darkness that seems to prey on those with grief? And God gave me guiding principles. And I, I've continued to do that in my job. The job I have right now, I'm the first person to have this job. There was no template. There was nobody training me. It was figure it out as you go and try to make inferences from these vague things that leaders are saying. And um, you know, the job description, the top, um, the top bullet was comfortable with ambiguity. <laughs> <laughs> which is so true, um, come to play, B very true. But uh, if I didn't have the spirit, I could not do what I do. I would be in a fetal position in the corner. Okay, next thing is um, I want to share these thoughts with you about true discipleship in the public arena because it will transform you. It will transform you. When you show up and you engage in the arena, the places where we have public dialogue and explore solutions and we talk about our differences, it changes us. Just by being present and earnestly listening, by practicing discipleship from a center of faith, compassion, and vision, we are transformed. And our heart is made new. We are changed. We are more. And so my first principle here would be people matter, see them. So often when we engage in the public arena, it is us versus them. Good versus evil, right versus wrong. We are the defender of truth and righteousness, are we not? We must stand, we must fight, we, but in the public arena, isn't it often just a little bit more complicated than that? Consider how often issues are framed with that polarized framework, an oversimplified model that positions people at extremes, and it makes for great reality TV or ratings-grabbing journalism, but real life and real <laughs> solutions Real people are much more nuanced. And because we understand the concept of progression, I think that is something the people of an LDS faith can understand. Often, I find myself very uncomfortable with overgeneralized false dichotomies. But how do we reconcile that? The rejection of a polarized framework. You have Lehi's teachings about opposition. He taught that for our agency to operate, for God's eternal purposes, there must be opposites, righteousness and wickedness, Holiness and misery, good and bad, life and death. Without opposites, Lehi said, all things must needs be a compound in one. Wherefore, it must needs have been created for a thing of naught. Wherefore, there would have been no purpose in the end of its creation. Wherefore, this thing must needs destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes. Central to the plan for our eternal happiness is the concept of polar opposites, that we might use our agency to act for ourselves and receive the punishment or happiness, which is affixed to answer the ends of the atonement. We all know from our own experience that while framing issues as good versus bad might be helpful, it might also oversimplify life's decisions. So it's incumbent upon us, as a higher use of our moral agency, to understand a situation in its entirety, or at least as much as we can, to resist oversimplification, to accurately assess the good and the evil. And as Lehi points out, some binary frameworks are indeed helpful, good and evil, life and death, charity and selflessness, virtue and debauchery. But note that Lehi's binary refers to attributes. His binary refers to attributes. They refer to behavior. They do not refer to people. Instead, in the public arena, in the greater conversation about what is good and what is not, dualities that refer to people, binaries that polarize people, are not only counterproductive, they can even be destructive. And I think we're seeing this play out over and over again. So today, I'm inviting you to resist placing people in a polarized duality. Instead, consider a faith-centered framework of complementarity, where each component is part of a greater whole, an interdependent entity, female and male, Democrat and Republican, LGBTQ and straight, Christian and Muslim, active and less active, black and white, Israeli and Palestinian, Batman and Superman, Okay, that was for my husband, but he's not here to appreciate it. Uh, the tension in these overgeneralizations is that often in the public arena and in everyday conversation, these dualities are formed as polar, as oppositional. Of course, there are many who benefit from that polarization. 
many who profit financially or politically by perpetuating tension and misunderstanding. And moreover, descriptions of the dialogue between and about oppositional dualities are frequently reduced to stereotypes and caricatures. Because after all, isn't it so much easier to dislike a caricature or an avatar or a pseudonym? Instead, what might happen if those oppositional dualities were framed as complementary or actually interdependent, each a unique part of the greater whole, each part of the total solution? Americans are more divided than ever along ideological lines. The partisan hostility runs deeper than ever. Now this data is probably two years old. One in four Americans have unfriended someone on Facebook for having different politics. I bet it might be higher now. I'm asking an earnest question. Are we hyperpolarized in our rhetoric? Are we hyperpolarized in our rhetoric, not only as a nation, but as a people of faith? I hope you were paying attention in the last general conference because we very intentionally have been working to not frame people as polarized opposites. And many of those addresses that were given will speak to that, to seeing people as God's child, as who they are. Do we allow a uh, victim vocabulary to frame a situation? Do we recognize battlefield vernacular in the way we talk about issues? Do we label people as evil who simply see things differently? Have we inadvertently turned every issue and every conversation into a zero-sum game where we all lose? Is it always us versus them? Are we, are, we, are we asking ourselves who the real enemy is? After all, is it not the father of lies who benefits most from the contention between God's children, the same children for whom Jesus Christ paid the ultimate debt? Can we not see the people and resist the poles? If we truly believe in the power of the atonement, I would argue we must. It seems that every possible communication channel is jammed right now with this cacophony of cutting, conflicting voices who are screaming at increasing and indecipherable decibels. With so much information flying at us, are we really getting any smarter? Sometimes it feels like confusion rather than clarity is pervasive. And whose tool is that? So no wonder everyone is so angry. It's right where the adversary wants us. In one of my favorite scriptural passages, Jesus says, For verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me. Behold, this is not my doctrine, to stir up the hearts of men with anger one against another, but this is my doctrine, that such things should be done away. So how do you do away with contention? Is it not even more incumbent upon us as disciples and civil residents of this glorious planet to, discover the, to decipher the good? to seek the truth, to share light. We can have an animated and even passionate discussion about ideas and, and issues and solutions without being unkind to the people who support or reject those ideas or issues or solutions. It's really a matter of mutual understanding and a matter of love. So when we truly see one another, we come to realize we have more in common than we thought. And there's often more that unites us than divides us. And I have found this to be true over the course of my career. While I might have previously belonged to a certain political party, I'm presently unaffiliated. <laughs> but I have great friends and allies in both parties. I have great friends and allies who completely disagree with me on principle, who might think certain public policy solutions that I would support are from a dark and evil source, right? but we can talk about them and still be friends because we see each other as people. We're discussing ideas. We're not discussing each other. Um, and we have to remember every soul is infinitely valued. I want to share this quote with you. Uh, when I began my employment with, with the church, uh, about six months in, I hit this faith crisis. <laughs> I just, like, Heavenly Father, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? What am I doing here? <laughs> I, it did, none of it made sense to me. I didn't feel like I fit. I didn't feel like I was making a difference. I couldn't see that I was valued. I couldn't see that anyone appreciated the work I was doing. And I came across this quote from Elder Robert Gay, who is one of my favorites, I'll have to admit. And he wrote, or he actually spoke at BYU-Idaho in their commencement. On, a speech is called Continuing Your Life's Journey. It was in 2013, July of that year. And he said this, in the days ahead, you will find many occasions to murmur, 
but remember that God is in control and is never absent. Remember that your call is to work after the manner of the Lord, not after the manner of men, and that by following his voice, you will become a powerful instrument in his hands for doing good. True success is to accomplish what the Lord sent you to earth to do. Never doubt yourself. You are a child of a loving Father in heaven. He has given you great blessings that he expects you to recognize. When you reach a game-changing crossroads, like graduation, he asks you not to shrink, but rather to act with deep faith, faith to revolutionize the world in which you live. So this quote has been on my desk the entire time I have been at church headquarters, and there have been some moments when I have wondered again, what am I doing here? Why am I here? What difference am I making? And these words speak to my spirit and my soul. And I encourage you, find things like this and hang on to them. They may have come out of somebody else's mouth, but your, your God is speaking to you in personal ways. So recognize them. Um, two years ago, well, actually three years ago this month, Heaven reclaimed a devoted servant whose name is Michael Frank Peterson. He worked in the public arena, served with tremendous faith in our church and community. And this quote from him is framed in my office. The work is never done. As the work gets harder, the purpose becomes clearer, the veil becomes thinner, spiritual eyes of understanding become sharper, barriers to spiritual communication fall down, and miracles happen. A miracle is a wondrous work of God, and I would contend each of you is a wondrous work of God, and within you are the seeds of infinity. You're meant to do wondrous works here and now, so I invite you to act with deep faith and revol revolutionize the world in which you live, and I leave that with you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.